Welcome to Mint. How are you feeling, man? Hey, Adam. Uh, I'm feeling fantastic today. Super excited <laughs> to talk to you. Any chance I get to talk about our work, I get I get excited about it. So, dude, I love this. I love to hear it. Let's just dive right in, okay? I want to talk about you specifically and start with your background, okay? Okay. What were you doing before crypto, and like where are you now? So before crypto, I was working as an artist um, and uh, spending a, a considerable amount of time doing that. Uh, mostly kind of you know selling my work through my website, selling a lot of prints, um, doing commissions, commission murals, things like that. Um, also working some uh, some day jobs as a as a software engineer, which I did enjoy doing uh, at a couple of different tech startups here in Austin. Uh, but generally, my life was kind of a balance between, yeah, doing doing my artwork stuff, doing kind of the day job, of course, normal everyday uh, activities. Um, but uh, it's post crypto, so I got into uh, heard about Art Blocks uh, earlier this year, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and um, released Fidenza in June of uh, this year, 2021. That was really my first. Uh, real nft drop and uh that's sort of went bananas uh, people seem to to really like that uh and since then everything has been totally different uh, i'm like living in a different universe now <laughs> and i'm really tied up in the crypto world like i've gotten to meet all these uh, uh really interesting people i mean it's a wild scene and uh, there's so many new things happening every day um it's a it's a struggle to keep up with i i get uh uh, some really amazing offers, uh, you know, for, for, for project ideas or collaborations or things like that um, every day. And it's, um, it's so cool to, to get all those opportunities. Um, it's, 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 uh, I can't keep up with it, even yeah. with help, but, um, but I'm really enjoying trying to keep up with it. All right. So what were you doing at tech startups? Like you've been talking yeah. about generative art and algorithmic art for years now. I've seen right. like a catalog of, of you doing speeches, talks, et cetera. Yeah. What were you doing working at startups and why? Yeah, well, uh, normally it doesn't really pay to be an artist. Um, maybe that's uh, a little bit different now with, with NFTs, but man, to be a full-time artist, um, let's say in 2020, you have to grind it out really hard. Like I've been working for years to, to, to build up my sales numbers, um, to, to build up a network of, of collectors and, and fans and um i was i was doing really well um I, I felt like i was building a pretty solid base uh to where i, I was able to go full-time back to uh, creating artwork full-time uh in february of this year before i did any sort of nft stuff uh, and i felt pretty comfortable with that so um I, I was making it okay but um it can be tough to transition from something like a software engineer salary to an artist salary yeah I mean, there's a pretty big difference in in pay um, also, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I studied computer science. Um, Where did you study? I studied computer science at the University of Texas at Austin, which okay. is a fantastic school. Cool. And um, yeah, I was, I, I was working at tech startups. Um, the one that I spent the most time at was a company called Datastacks. And I worked on an open source distributed database called uh, Apache Cassandra. And um, I worked on the database itself, sort of the internals of the database engine. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on the client drivers, so like uh, the Python driver for interacting with the database. So that was a lot of re actually really interesting engineering work. It was um, uh, very, very challenging, very performance sensitive. There was a lot of uh, community aspect to it since it's an open source project, yeah. which I really liked. Um, so overall, it, it was a really good job. I mean, I, there was very little for me to complain about um, with those jobs, which is part of why I, I think I continue doing it for so long. Yeah. How has your time working at startups kind of translated to what you're doing now? Is there any correlation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you're an artist, you're, you're, you're ultimately also an entrepreneur. The product you're selling is, is your own artwork. Um, sometimes as an artist, it's not comfortable to think about it that way. But if you're going to be pragmatic and realistic, I think that's, that's ultimately um, the story. And so uh, working at startups gave me a much stronger sense for, for how to run a business. And I was lucky enough to be really early stage at, at the startups I worked at. And so I got a really clear firsthand view of, um, you know, how you think about, um, 
marketing and sales and accounting and things like I don't know totalable total addressable market and um, you know we can yeah. go go into depth on it but um, it's are you, nice are you to telling be... me that you measure the total addressable market for <laughs> our blocks for dead before no no not necessarily it. like uh, no I haven't explicitly done that but it's nice to be able to put on that sort of businessman hat right. and, and analyze things through that lens um, I I definitely I have to play a lot of roles. Like I said, um, there, there's like a marketing role to it. And, and as much as it makes me uncomfortable, I have to sometimes sort of put on that marketing hat and, and look at these things through a marketing lens and say, okay, like, who's my audience? Who are my fans? Like, who, who really enjoys this artwork? Who do I want to connect with the most? Um, and so, yeah, my time at, at uh, working at the startups, um, really helped solidify that that mindset for me and also the mindset of sort of being able to tackle any problem that you you, you set your mind to a startup when you're at a startup you you encounter all these really uh unique challenges all, all the time and uh, you have no choice but to, to try to tackle them otherwise your, your company's not going to make it and so um i i think it kind of taught me a little bit of a resiliency as well that's been really beneficial yeah. for me yeah can you talk to me a bit of your upbringing I know behind the scenes we said you're a drummer, but yeah. how, how creative were you uh, growing up to, like when did you start tinkering with software? Like what, what's the story behind yeah. that and as you grew up? Sure. Um, I grew up uh, probably like a, a pretty vanilla uh, childhood. I grew up in central Texas, uh, middle class. Um, I went to a pretty good school. Um, I was a good kid. Um, I, I did do a lot of creative activities. I was always drawing and painting. I loved uh, Legos uh, and Play-Doh, and I, I remember going to a lot of after-school uh, art classes and, and, and painting and things like that. Um, my first encounter with uh, programming, so, so I have an older brother who's about four or five years older, and he um, taught himself to program pretty early on, and um, he was always kind of a, uh, an inspiration to me, and um, so I think I... Uh, first started dabbling with programming when I was, let's say, about 14 or so. Okay. I, I remember uh, writing a QBasic program, one that made a ball bounce around uh, the screen, and another <laughs> one that like played a tune with the, 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 the little beeper on the computer. Uh -huh. um, and from there, uh, took computer science classes in, in high school and... Uh, when it came time for college, I wanted to go to art school. I felt a little more strongly about that. Uh, but uh, my dad kind of talked me into studying computer science for more pragmatic reasons, which is, is not necessarily bad advice. Um, and so that's why I, I, I kind of went down that route. But um, yeah, I've always had um, a little bit more of an independent uh, streak. So yeah, when I was a teenager, I spent the majority of my free time actually skateboarding. Um, that was probably the dominant thing oh, that I cool. did. Um, if if I had the athletic ability to be a pro skater, I think that's probably what I would have done, but I just wasn't blessed in that way. Um, and maybe I didn't have the, the, the full level of insanity or it's, that's required for that as well. Um, but uh, music as well. Yeah, like you mentioned, uh, drumming. Um, I, I've been playing musical instruments since I was about 10. I think I can play maybe five or six different instruments wow. decently at this point. Um, drumming is my, is my favorite one. Um, yeah, I played in like some, some punk bands when I was in high school. And then, uh, later on a little more interesting music got into, um, uh, post rock a lot and played, um, in, in some post rock bands. So, uh, creative creativity has always been a huge part of my life. Um, I consider skateboarding to be a really creative activity mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so for me, it's always just been kind of like a choice of which one of those I, I want to focus on. And ultimately, um, uh, art, uh, kind of won out, uh, yeah. over skateboarding and drumming. Yeah. So at, at what point did you kind of become self-aware enough to see that your creative side was merging with your development side? Yeah, that, that was, um, that was actually a really explicit, uh, thing. It didn't happen by accident. Um, so I... You know, I, I was working at these uh, tech startup jobs. Um, like, like I said, I enjoyed it, but um, in the background, I was starting to take art way more seriously, and I was spending a lot of my free time um, pretty uh, intently trying to learn and create new artwork. And I remember um, 
hearing advice that artists should try to do try to create work that that only they could could create and and part of how you do that is by involving as many aspects of your yourself and your, and your life and your personality as you can into the artwork and for me at that time programming was such a big part of my life that uh, uh, it would have been a mistake to not try to involve it in my artwork in some way and so i started actively thinking about how can i involve uh, programming in, in my artwork and um uh that wasn't as clear of a a, a thing to do either uh, as you might think um I, I had a few missteps uh but but eventually i kind of had the idea to create a a program that that generated a painting that was that was my sort of initial thought and that that was kind of the first steps that i took and i wasn't really aware of the generative art scene or or the history of it at that point and um that was just kind of my my, my first steps into merging the two and it it went so well right out right away. Um, I, it wasn't polished, but but it was interesting right away, and I could tell that it was worth investigating. And yeah. um, that was about seven years ago, and um, I really haven't looked back since. Yeah, I'd be curious to see some of your sketches as a child and see what that was like compared to what you're creating now. Do you have any of those? Maybe not at hand, I mean, or maybe at hand. Do you have some uh, nearby? <laughs> yeah, it might be better to post some on. on yeah. Your notes. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. like looking behind yeah, me. I have like uh, right I have now, like a yeah. lunch bag that I drew on and wrote like "I love you, mom" that's hanging on my <laughs> wall. I think I must have been four, so I don't know if you're going to be able to connect a lot of dots between those two. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put. We'll I'll, I'll, I'll dig some up and we'll put them in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Super cool. All right. Let's let's dive more into the crypto side of things. Okay. Um, sure. I love how you grew up super creative. By the way, similar like me, I got started playing the drums at like five years old. I also doodled, but not to the That's extent awesome. that you did. Um, unlike you, I only know the drums, and I always stuck uh, st stuck with the drums. If you're gonna uh, pick one, you pick the right one. So, dude, you know, growing up, <laughs> it was one of those things where my dad, when I told him I want to play the drums, and I was like yeah. five years old, he's like, "What about piano?" And he sent me to like a piano lesson. He, and I like, like no, nah, piano's not for me. I was like, I want to play yeah. the drums. What about guitar? Yeah. He's like, no. Nah. I was like, no, not guitar. And then we got a drum set and the rest is history. But I think starting as a creative and then transitioning into crypto, transitioning in, into NFTs, I think there's a lot of like interesting purview and insight you develop as one because you see the world of like the creative side merge with more of what, I mean, what started as very technical, right? Very experimentative. Yeah. Now it's more creative, right? Through NFTs and whatnot. But Absolutely. You, you get to see the merge of like two different worlds. And I want to talk more about that merge with you. But more okay. specifically, like you came across NFTs this year, right? Through art. Yes, books. correct. What was the first NFT you bought? And if not, was it just one that you listed for sale? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first one that I bought was... Let's see. I minted something through Artblocks. I want to say it might have been uh, Subscape by Matt Delorier, which is a, a fantastic Artblocks release. Um, that was either the first one or, or, or something soon after, or sorry, yeah. something uh, shortly before that. Um, and uh, what was the other part of the question? So I, I guess like when you first discovered NFTs, right? The first yeah. one you you first minted one, or you first list, listed one for sale. So you first minted one, right? Yeah, I first minted one. Yeah, and strictly on Art Blocks. Uh, yes. Although okay. I, I'll say I did uh I did do a little test uh mint on on um, H E N um mm -hmm. mostly because there was a specific show that I wanted to get into uh <laughs> curated by uh Ann Spalter who who is fantastic and I have a lot of respect for. Uh, but you had to have an NFT in order to get into the show. And um, although I had this art blocks release coming up, I uh, the deadline was earlier than that. And so I put something out there without really talking about it um, in order to get it uh, into the show. So I have a couple yeah. of really early things on HEN, but that's Got it. Got it. So for those who don't know what art blocks is, can you give a quick breakdown just so we start with that? Yeah, absolutely. So art blocks is a platform uh based on top of ethereum and essentially they've designed a, a smart contract and a website that enables generative artists like myself uh to do the following basically we can uh write a a, a program that generates artwork in javascript 
and we actually uh, write it to the blockchain, to the Ethereum blockchain. And then whenever collectors use our blocks, they go to the website interface and they, when they click the, the purchase button or the mint button, it, uh, at that point, it uh, triggers the script to, to be run and to generate a new piece of artwork and to, to generate an NFT that is then instantly uh, transferred to the collector. So um, at the time of purchase, the, neither the collector nor the artist nor, nor art blocks knows exactly what's going to come out. Um, everybody has seen some of the output from the script, so you have a general idea of, of what you're going to get, but um, you don't know the specifics of it. And um, the artist also sets some basic parameters like the number of mints. So, uh, for example, with, with my project Fidenza, there were 999, and they had a fixed price at the time. Now there's some more complex auction models, but um, essentially the gist of it is generative artists can, can put up these programs uh, that uh, generate artwork, NFTs, and uh, collectors um, are able to enjoy and, and purchase Amazing. this. Amazing. So can you talk to me more about your aha moment with NFTs? Do you remember where you were when you yes. had that, holy shit, I should be making art here? Yes. Everything yes. that I've been preaching the last two years, this <laughs> this was made for it. The last few years, this yes. was made for it. Tell me, t talk to me about that. Yeah, I think uh, the exact moment for me was I saw uh, Chetel Golid's archetype uh, program. I think he tweeted about it. Um, this was his uh, big art blocks release. And um, I've been a, I've been a big fan of his work for, for years. I've been following his work for years. Um, but seeing how he did it for art blocks um, just instantly sold me on the concept. Um, and I could just tell how perfect of a fit uh, this was for generative art. And, and generative art has had such a hard time being uh being monetized in the past really like earning a living for for the artists and this was the first time where it, it felt like um uh, such a good fit between the artist the collector kind of the purity of of all these outputs come straight from the program um in this like totally provable documented way and um i was i, I was fortunate enough to be able to see uh you know chettle had, had done his work and um uh, dimitri cherniak had also done ringers and just by looking at those two projects, um, I could tell this was going to be amazing. And I think the exact same day that I saw that, I put in my application to be on the Artblocks program. Yeah. That's pretty big. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And, and how long have you been, I guess, preaching about uh, generative art, algorithmic <laughs> art? And I only asked that yeah. because I literally came across a video of you doing a lecture on YouTube that was right. dated two years ago. Right. So yeah. you've been at it for some time. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, let's see here. I've been writing essays about it since I think 2015, maybe it was 2014. Um, because I found the ideas and, and the conceptual aspect of it to be really interesting. I think, um, it's a whole new design paradigm, introducing randomness in, into how you do the designs. And it's, it's, it's about building a system. And, um, there's so many interesting aspects of like, you know, what does the com computer mean to the artwork? How is it involved in the art artwork? How does it affect our aesthetics? How do we take the outside world and, and, and view it through the lens of computers? Like what's the relationship there? There's so many interesting aspects to it. Um, and so I've been trying to write about it and, and, and talk about it at, at conferences for, um, for years now. I think, let's see, I did um, a, a strange loop talk called how to hack a painting in 2017 it was about um, a watercolor algorithm that I designed that um, a lot of people found uh, t to be kind of inspiring and to, to show them a little bit about what generative art means. Um, but uh, all the way to this day, I, I, I continue to write the essays. I've, I wrote a couple this year that um, I feel pretty um, proud of that um, there's, not a, a, there's not a lot of thought leadership in the generative art community. And, and from a perspective of the thoughtful analysis of what the work means, how it how it's different from what uh, preceded it, um, where it has the potential to go. Um, art critics have sort of distanced themselves from this medium for decades now. And so they, very few of them have any idea what's going on here. And so I think uh, it's kind of up to, to people in my position, like artists who actually know what's going on, to try to, to educate about it um, and, and, and try and 
evolve and advance our view of, of what's possible and what's going on. Um, and so that's, that's part of why I, I, I write those essays is to, to, to help, uh, yeah. educate uh, collectors and other artists as well. Yeah. I want to pivot for a minute and talk about like this creative Renaissance that we're in and some call it a Renaissance. And I'd love to hear your point of view. Are we in the middle of a Renaissance? Oh, I, I would be surprised if we weren't, um, this is this is basically the first time that digital artists have ever been able to earn a living creating their artwork um and not just generative artists but like digital artists in general usually that's just uh that was a sentence to poverty if that's right. what your art form was right. before and um digital art is so important like so much of our lives are digital now we spend so much time in front of the computers you and i are talking through a computer right now um, and you probably spent the six hours before this looking at a computer, and I'll probably spend the next six hours looking at a computer. Um, digital art is created and exists in a realm that we spend a lot of our time in now. And I think it's um, so important to bring that artistic influence into the digital realm uh, and, and to value it there just as much as we value it in the physical realm. And uh, so this has been such an such an important opportunity that now that digital artists actually have the opportunity to to focus on this work and, and earn a living from it um i think the results are going to be absolutely incredible um so it's still early days but like i said i would be incredibly surprised if this wasn't the start of of, of a sort of renaissance yeah it's cool because early march is i mean my my earliest I guess, interaction with NFTs started 2017 with CryptoKitties, okay? And I would argue that maybe that was a lot of other people's entrance into NFTs, but I never did anything about it, okay? I was in, high, I was in college during that time. I was just taking my first blockchain course, learning about smart contracts and even programming a little bit, or at least attempting to. And it wasn't until October, probably also like September of last year, Okay, yeah. October 20th, September 2020, where it really started like kicking in. I finally yeah. understood like what this medium was. And then I saw artists doing really cool things with it. And then I saw musicians monetizing and fractionalizing their songs with it. And then I saw people who otherwise wouldn't have made a dime off their work becoming hot shots online. And yeah. it's almost as if like the stigma of the starving artist was starting to decline. But only for, I guess, for a certain group of people, maybe not for everybody, because everybody's trying to like, or a lot of people are trying to become NFT artists and, and do their things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure everybody has their own unique approach, okay? Right. Um, for you specifically, the Fidenzas is something that stood out to me. Um, I saw it trending on Twitter, and the likes of the, 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 the founders of Three Arrow Capital talking a lot about it, they being absolutely in love uh, with the work as well as other people. and. I got to tell you, it's super unique and not to toot your own horn. Yeah. I never really appreciated like, oh, that's even a far statement. I appreciated NFTs, but I really, I really enjoy looking at your stuff. I'll tell you that. Thank you. So I much. love the color, the, the palettes that you use. And I think it's super unique. And yeah. my, ne my next question is like, how did we get there? How did we get to this style of art? How did you get to the mm -hmm. point where you were inputting something and outputting another, and it was outputting another thing. You're like, Wow, this is it. Yeah. This, this is this is a fidenza. This is me. Yeah, talk to me about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, fantastic question. So, fidenza did not uh, come from a vacuum. It is absolutely the culmination of of years of work. Um, with all of my work, I tend to use parts and pieces of previous algorithms. Um, it's one of the, what's one of the amazing things of this medium is that you can do that so easily. And so uh, some of those pieces that I've reused a lot, um, uh, one that I've written about is called uh, Flow Fields. This is not necessarily something that, 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 that I came up with. Um, it's kind of a general algorithm that um, other artists use as well, but it's something that um, I find very special and I've had a lot of um, uh, creative luck with it. Let's put it that way. And so uh, that's sort of the basis of, of, of the Fidenza algorithm. And I've been experimenting with flow fields for mm, about four years now. And I'm just trying 
everything I can think of really uh, to see how it looks and uh, to, to create something new. And during that time, I've also been experimenting with um, uh, different different color palettes and, and building my taste for colors. That's um, not something that, that comes easily. I think every artist has to discover their own set of colors that, that works for them. And it takes a long time to find those color relationships that, um, that are harmonious or that, that offer the types of interests that, uh, that you enjoy. And so um, uh, those sorts of things built up. I also, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've uh, been influenced by so many uh, artists, particularly a lot of painters, honestly, mm. my, my biggest influences, I would say are painters. And so um, I think you can look at, um, uh, for example, there's, a, there's a particular set of, of Kandinsky paintings that um, I think are probably pretty influential uh, with Fidenza in terms of uh, the color palette and, and um, kind of the, the, the rhythm uh, and spacing of the shapes and, and the use of negative space. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so many different um, artistic influences that, that have all played subtle uh, roles in, in shaping Fidenza as well. And um, yeah, I think if you, if you look at uh, my past work and, and trace it up to Fidenza, I think you'll, you'll see that chain of, of influence and how those ideas evolved and how I was able to, to build on them. And um, I think it'll continue to go that way. I don't plan to do any sort of like Fidenza 2.0, but um, uh, all those ideas are still available and, and in play for my future work as well. And so, um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's just yeah. been sort of the culmination of all these parts and pieces that have stacked up in order to um, they, they all kind of came together at the right moment and sort of the stars aligned. I got lucky that I had the right algorithm ready to go at the right time for, for, for Fidenza to be a thing. Well, one thing that's super unique about Fidenza's and I guess your work in general is the aesthetic portion behind it. And one thing that you do really well is turning aesthetic into code, right? Yeah. Yeah. What does that mental model look like? Like how, how, how does that work in your head? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Paint that for me. How do you turn yeah. aesthetic into code? Yeah, that's the real challenge, isn't it? Um, it's, you know, it's so um, interesting with generative art. Okay, so I'm going to co compare and contrast with painting a little bit. Painting, okay. you, when you create a painting as an artist, you, you have an internal sense of aesthetic, and you, you kind of learn to follow your intuition when you create a painting. Sometimes you're explicitly thinking about let's let's call them like rules like like i don't know uh leaving particular amount of margin or leaving more space at the bottom or not making things top heavy or focal points or whatever but by and large you're, you're following your intuition and you're saying like let me try this does this look good or does this look bad if it looks mm -hmm. good i'll keep it if it looks bad i'm going to try and change it um and so you're making all these sort of like micro decisions uh, based on this like loose internal aesthetic guide that you have when you're a generative artist you can't do that. You have to make everything much more explicit uh, in the sense that it has to go into the code somehow, uh, especially with something like Fidenza where there's no room for curation. Anything that comes out of the program might end up in the hands of a, a collector as a, as a finished work. And so you have to do your best to figure out why you have a particular aesthetic, why you enjoy something looking a particular way. And um, you try to turn that into a, kind of a set of guidelines. Now, with, with, with generative art, or, or most of it, especially something like Fidenza, the program is not an explicit set of instructions to generate one image. You're designing a whole system or a whole program that can generate sort of a realm of different artwork. And there, there's randomness that's very carefully mixed into the program at kind of a structural level so that each time you run the program, you get something different. And as a result, the program becomes a really loose set of guidelines rather than like an explicit design for, for, for one image. Um, and so, yeah, you start thinking a lot more generally, a lot more systematically about those aesthetics. You start thinking a lot about the relationship between the components and you start thinking about uh, probabilities. I spent a lot of time uh, fine tuning really? probabilities. So things really? like, like, um, so there's a lot of functions that are dedicated to picking colors for shapes. 
And those will have probabilities of, of, of selecting different colors. And um, the probabilities of each of those are, are very fine tuned. And sometimes they're influenced by things like proximity to other colors or the size of the shape or the position of the shape. And so, um, yeah, you, you do your best to come up with these, these rules that might on average make it look better. Uh, but you also have to be careful not to stifle the program. There's uh, a lot to be said for this this property of emergence, which is uh, when when something happens that you don't expect, right? So like these programs have relatively simple rules, um, and but sometimes the randomness and the rules interact in a really unexpected way, and, and these really cool results emerge. And... Um, if it's at all possible as a generative artist, you want to allow room for, for that emergence to happen. And so there's a there's a, a careful tension between trying to, to lock down the program so that it only has sort of good output uh, and, and still leaving enough breathing room so that this sort of emergence can happen. And it's really tough to achieve uh, both of those at the same time. You got to be honest, you lost me, yeah. <laughs> but, but listen, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. How, I know. Like, I, I spend a lot more time thinking no, about that I'm just, I'm just, else. I'm just yeah. giving you a hard time, but you know, like what I'm imagining, please correct me if I'm wrong, is when you're looking at your screen or screens and you're developing these probabilities and writing this code, is it just like, and this is because I'm literally playing stupid as hell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just like you have a terminal and then you right. have like what the output would look like yeah. and you're constantly changing different variables yeah. until it looks like what you want it to look like? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, basically what I'm looking at is kind of like a, it's a screen full of code, like okay. uh, take your stereotypical hacker on a right. movie and right. like <laughs> that's basically what I'm looking at. Okay. And then, yeah, I have a, a second window that has the output from the program. Okay. And so I, I change some code, I, I rerun it, and the image updates, and I'm able to tell whether it looks good or not. And um, yeah, I, I, I repeat that cycle over and over again, hundreds of times while working on a new program. Yeah. What's up, guys? Adam Levy here. Sorry for the quick pause, but I wanted to give some love to our three NFT sponsors that are making this episode a reality. They are Coinvise, Poop, and Social Stack. On Coinvise, you can create a personal or community-owned social token on Ethereum. Coinvise also helps you create incentives through token rewards and bounties, NFT business models, and bot integrations for Discord. Discover more by visiting coinvise.co today. Next up, we have POAP, or short for Proof of Attendance Protocol, who enables a novel way of creating one's life diary. Leveraging NFT technology, Poop facilitates an easy way to mint non-fungible tokens related to meaningful events. It's frequently used in crypto-native communities and now it's starting to create NFT collectors in the mainstream too. Collect or launch your own Poop today by visiting poap.xyz. Next up, we have SocialStack, a platform for communities, brands, and creators to build mission-driven social token economies offering an easy to use non-custodial wallet with a suite of open source community engagement tools. Social Stack makes it simple to bring your community into Web3 and be a part of creating an open source gratitude driven future for social tokens. Create a free social token wallet, discover mission driven social token communities, or apply to launch your own token on Social Stack by visiting socialstack.co today. All right, back to the episode. What goes into choosing the the, the probabilistic color palettes that you that you choose and that you're after how do you find that inspiration where does that come from um yeah that's that's a great question it, it, it it's really tricky um sometimes i have uh sort of sets sets of colors and balances that i've used before that that tend to work and i'll, I'll use those as a starting point so um like with fidenza the 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 most likely color palette, well, I'll say there's the main color palette is, is the Lux color palette. And, and this is one that, that kind of has like a, a cream background and uh, a lot of color variety. There's yeah. like 16 different colors involved in it. And um, those I, I kind of like started with a core set of colors that I really enjoy working with. So some reds, some yellows, some pinks, um, uh, particular shades of blue. And I was just looking for ways to expand that. So I'm adding colors that didn't conflict with what was there. And so sometimes 
that means uh, adding more, you know, more neutral colors in order to add variety without um, sort of turning it into a giant rainbow. So like I might in that case add browns or tans or like a really desaturated yellow or something like that. Um, in other cases, uh, for other color palettes, uh, maybe I had more specific thoughts. So, so like another Fidenza one, there's the rose palette. Mm -hmm. And for that one, I was really thinking about a rose bush. Like I'm um, thinking, I like, uh, absolutely like um, sort of floral combinations in the sense of I love the, the tones of the foliage and kind of the depth you get there. And then just these little, these pops of the, you know, the, the really saturated uh, reds and pinks and, and uh, peach colors. And um, so sometimes I have, uh, maybe a, a, a physical reference that I'm at least thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't really ever use like a photo reference or um, I, I, I never like uh, take colors directly from somebody else's work. Um, uh, but sometimes I'm, I'll think about things like I'll think about a sunset or a landscape or uh, a rose bush and um, kind of use that as a conceptual starting point for, for the color palette. Yeah. You know what I think about when I see your work? And it's actually so funny that you tell me your background is in, 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 I don't think you mentioned this live, but you told me behind the scenes that you were a jazz drummer. Yeah. Right. right. Your art really reminds me of jazz music for whatever oh, that's reason. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. because like the way, and I, I think, and you use certain keywords to describe the, the, the curves and the straightness and uh, the, the edginess and whatnot. So forgive me if I yeah. butcher it, but right. I'm imagining the one specifically with the, I think the Luxor palette, uh, yeah. color palette with the tan background and yep that really reminds me of jazz music it really it. it really reminds me of like all the curviness and how everything is literally about to touch each other yeah. and how like yeah. oh that feels but it just fits it works it it, 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 it yeah. looks and it feels good and when you're listening to jazz it's so experimentative it's so yeah. it's so out there but it gets you thinking it gets your curiosity going and it's weird yeah. how I don't know. Is there any correlation oh, yeah. between you? <laughs> oh yeah. Tell oh, me yeah. about that. <laughs> no, I think about the I think about the relationship between music and visual art all the time. I, I love that you brought up that connection. I think it's a fantastic one. I mean, so so for people that aren't familiar with jazz, uh, uh, kind of the way it works is there's usually a set of standards. So there's like one or two or three hundred songs that basically every jazz musician knows. And, but the part that they know is like it's kind of like the intro and like maybe like the, the chords for the chorus. And then so, so they'll start out. Uh, they have that structure just to get started. That's the standard part of it. And then there's all this room for improvisation in the middle. And that's where they take solos and do whatever they want to do, really. Um, and so it's this really interesting blend of, of uh, structure and then let's call it chaos or, or, or creativity. And generative art is very much the same way. It's it's very much a, at least for me, it's very much a blend of that that order and and chaos. And um, uh, I love like taking that structure and then and then just bending it and warping it and and seeing what direction it can go when you inject that that kind of chaotic element to it. So uh, yeah, there's there's a big parallel with jazz there. So I, I love that you uh, spotted yeah. that out. Who are, who are some of your favorite jazz artists? Whether they be individual players, groups, or general? Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see here. I mean, maybe this is um, uh, too cliche, but uh, uh, Miles Davis has, has always been uh, huge for me. Let's see, lately I've been listening to a lot of uh, uh, Jack Wilkins, who's a jazz guitarist, a lot of Bill Evans, who's a, a great pianist. Um, some of my favorite drummers, I'm going to say probably Tony Williams. Um, uh, like Mel Lewis a lot as well. Um, that's not going to mean anything to anybody who's not into jazz, <laughs> unfortunately. So I won't keep going. But uh, um, I, I, I love some uh, some contemporary stuff as well. Like uh, Micaiah McRaven is, is super cool because they, they take jazz and they start to blend it with this like real electronic computer influenced yeah. uh, aesthetic. Yeah, and it so it's it's there's a lot of parallel with with generative art. So yeah. Do you I'm listen to jazz? Do you listen to jazz, or did you listen to jazz, or what type of music, if any, did you yeah. listen to when you were creating Fidenzas? I'm certain I listen to jazz. I, I, I generally <laughs> listen to instrumental music. It was probably either jazz or, or post rock, or uh, listen to a lot of Spanish uh, language cool. music because it's a little easier to kind of background in my head. So yeah. yeah. All right. If I could name one song that reminds me of Fidenza, yeah, that what starts it? like standard and experimentative is Giant Steps. I'd say that's yeah, <laughs> that yes. that that's a good comparison for me yes. at least. Subjective, subjective. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I like that. I'm going to need to listen to that while looking at the artwork now and yeah. think about it. Yeah. You have to, you have to. Um, okay. I want to, I want to pivot more and talk about uh, the creator economy with you. Okay. Okay. Uh, because I think you're the epitome of, of, or not the epitome, but you're a good example of, people tapping into their creative side and taking it one step further and being experimentative and exploring a new medium. For example, yeah. your base and your foundation growing up or in early career was software engineer. You worked yeah. with startups, you built right. traditional and non-traditional products for companies, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but you always had your creative side. You all, you, you still, you, you practiced what you preached. You still did the conferences. You still talked about generative art. And it wasn't until you met the medium of NFTs where everything I feel like kind of synced or at least started to sync. And here we are today yeah. on this podcast. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And I think you're a good example of maybe there's a lot of software on engineers out there that have yet to tap into their creative side. Right. Yes. And experiment more with this medium. How can we get more developers to tap into their creative side? Ooh. Uh, yeah. Wonderful question. I, first of all, I think you're spot on. I think, um, I think programmers in general are a very creative bunch. I mean, when you're programming, there's not a set way to tackle any problem. There's always a, a huge number of trade-offs and a huge number of options. And um, coming up with those designs is a very creative enterprise. And so I think there's uh, a, a huge potential for programmers to, to get involved in more uh, creative media, just like you say. Um, whether that's visual art, whether that's music, uh, whether that's uh, film, architecture, uh, textiles, like the list goes on and on and on. Um, I think that's, uh, I think there's a couple couple aspects to, to how we can get more people doing that. First of all, it's just showing those people the opportunity. So I, I get emails um, literally every day from software engineers saying like, they saw my artwork or, or they listened to one of my talks or they read one of my essays and uh, they had like a, a mind blowing experience when they realized that they could take this this uh, skill that they've honed for years and they could use it f towards creative, uh, personally fulfilling means um, or, or oh, ends, I should that? say. That's so and, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think part of it's just like creating that awareness that this is even an option. Um, I, I think the second part would actually be Kind of going the opposite direction so um uh making people in those fields let's say architecture and textiles and whatever making them aware that that, that programming is a is a technique that they could use for their own work um, because it's so so powerful it, it almost doesn't matter what you apply it to um there's there's exciting things that you can do whenever you involve uh programming in your in your field and so i think making the the tools more accessible making uh, the education more right, widespread so that more people have programming skills uh, will play a role and um, just creating some some opportunities for crossover right like allowing software engineers maybe to pair up with uh, these people in the in, in their existing industries um, i think all of those things will uh, help to unleash more creative power around computation yeah yeah how do you see the future of nfts kind of transforming the creator economy as we know Ooh, um, big question. Um, I think that it may, there's a chance that it uh, changes the relationship uh, that, that artists have had with existing institutions. So specifically, I'm thinking of, of galleries and, and museums and sort of people have uh, played like a gatekeeping role in some ways. Now, gatekeeping has a, a strong negative connotation and I don't necessarily mean it in that way. Um, I think they they bring a lot of value in terms of bringing a, an open-minded and, and um, educated uh, background to, to, to evaluating artists and, and doing their best to um, kind of expose what they consider to be the best work uh, to collectors. But um, definitely at NFTs, create the opportunity for a much more direct direct relationship between uh, collectors and, and artists. And um, that can be healthier for in, in some ways. It's probably not the right model for everybody, but I, I think that's a, a possibility. Uh, I'm really interested to see how DAOs play out long-term. Um, 
like I've been hearing about Dow's funding, like feature films and um sort of like new style museums and um funding, maybe <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> funding um uh new work by by artists and um uh that'll be that'll be really interesting to see um man it's it, it still feels so early and everything's changing so fast that um even being in the middle of it i have a hard time <laughs> predicting uh where it's gonna go but um uh I'll just say overall, I, I have really positive uh, expectations for for the impact of NFTs on on artists and other creators. Yeah. Why do you think collectors kind of woke up to the idea and value behind uh, generative art and algorithmic art all of a sudden? Because you've been doing yeah. that for years, right? You've yes. Been selling yeah, yeah. individual pieces right. for years. Right. Do you think it's because art blocks the platform? Do you think it's just... I think partly because of the timing of NFTs, right? And people looking for mm -hmm. pieces and one of ones or whatever it may be. Yeah. Like what, what is the explanation behind why the world is waking up to this today? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, um, behind the scenes, I felt like the energy for, for generative art has been building over the last few years. Um, so just to give a quick history lesson, generative art has existed since the 1960s. Um, and uh, it was pretty rudimentary back then, but, um, basically, since then, it's been uh, panned by critics and mostly ignored by collectors. Um, and right now, we're on what I think is, is fair to call the third wave of generative art. And so I, I would put artists like myself and, and artists like um, Dimitri Cherniak and uh, Chettle Gold and Matt Delorier and uh, Alexi Andre and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and sort of a third wave where I, I personally feel like the quality of the work has gone up a lot. Um, I think we're starting to get a more diverse set of backgrounds kind of uh, focusing on creating generative art. And so I think there's more interesting artwork for one. Um, I think that, um, yeah, it, NFTs have uh, essentially made collecting digital work palatable, like um, you know, everybody jokes about, uh, you know, buying a JPEG or whatever, but like collecting digital art in, I don't know, 2016 literally meant buying a JPEG, like you would <laughs> charge your credit card and they would email you a JPEG, right? Like it's just not satisfying. There's something deeply not satisfying about that. And for whatever reason, uh, NFTs changed that. Like we have built a social consensus that, that owning an NFT means something. And, um, uh, when that so social consensus exists, um, almost nothing else matters. Like if we all say it means something, then it yeah. means something. And, um, exactly. so, so I think people feel empowered, um, to, to collect NFTs. They, I think they, they feel that it's meaningful now. I think they enjoy that it goes directly to the artists in most cases. Um, I think that it's, uh, creates so much more of a community now. Um, uh, everybody can see who's holding all the pieces from an artist. You can see, um, exactly who bought bought and sold and for how much and um, you can trace the history of every individual piece and um, with something like generative art it almost kind of uh, for like something like Fidenza like a long long form generative uh, algorithm it almost builds a community itself like there's a set of Fidenza holders that um, have overlapping interests and in, and they sort of all meet through the artwork and and it builds yeah. a community pretty naturally um, and so yeah there's there's a real culmination of factors that it feels like almost overnight have um, really enabled generative art to, to finally have kind of a moment in the sun. Yeah. How do you imagine the future of, of, of your creator economy, your personal economy kind of forming and manifesting over time? Hmm. Um, are you essentially asking like, what do I see for my future? <laughs> yeah. But, but in a sense where, because now you're at the core of ownership, right? You're right. at the core of monetization direct yeah. to the buyer there is no i don't know what what art blocks fees are okay but right. you're now developing a unique relationship and unique communication channel with your collectors and Absolutely. the rest of the world who's watching right which right over time will manifest and you'll build an even bigger audience you know at least i'm betting on that you'll build even larger collector base you're you're basically like redefining what it means to be a creator right you're yeah. you're, you're building your own micro economy essentially right yeah yeah. How do yeah. you see that kind of forming and, and transforming and manifesting over time? Oh man, uh, I wish somebody I wish somebody could tell me that. Um, 
Yeah. It, it, man. And I guess you can even take this from like, what do you want to see happen? Yeah. Um, my here's here's my main goals. It's easier for me to talk about what I would like to see yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, first of all, I I like to make artwork, and I like I like to try to make good artwork, and so um. That's something I think about every day is like, what steps can I take that will help to make sure that I make good artwork? I'm definitely interested in, in, in the quality of it and, and trying to do something new and trying to keep just keep myself interested. Like that's why I started making art in the first place. And I think it would be really um, foolish for me to 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 put that aside. Like uh, I'm doing my best to keep that front and center um, just because I love doing it and um, and it makes me really happy to, to make our work. And so um, uh, whatever helps me to make our work is, is kind of at the front. And second, I would say uh, I really do love the, the community aspect of it and I want positive outcomes for the community. And I'm hoping that that involves um, learning. I'm gonna do my best to help to educate people about generative art, about what makes it interesting, about what other artists are making um, uh, great work and um, and maybe just about you know the history of our work in general, just um, helping to educate people and get people interested in our work. I think is is a beautiful thing, and um, I mean I, I love uh, helping to to grow a community that has positive vibes. I mean, yeah. like <laughs> uh, maybe that sounds you know naive or or, or whatever, but um, like. Anything we anything we can do to just make like happy places where where we get to just be friends and like hang out and, yeah. and enjoy things is awesome. Like there's no reason that um, uh, that we can't do that. And um, I'm sure there'll be challenges, but I would love to help uh, cultivate that sort of sense of of, of positive community as well. Uh, maybe a community of, of of giving back and 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 being charitable. That's something I think about a lot as well. And, yeah. and have plans for so um yeah i think that's i think that's what i would like to see the most are those things and and who knows what sort of like you know financial things will happen to that, that affect that um that that'll go however it goes i think as long as we keep our eye on on the important goals um that uh we can tolerate sort of whatever else happens along the way part of your important goal is the community side Okay. And part of growing a community is increasing the amount of collectors that collect Fidenza. And part of the increasing the amount of collectors, I could argue, is also the fractionalization of Fidenzas. Yeah. Does does fractional like you seeing a p your your piece fractionalized? Does that excite you? Does that scare you? Does that yeah. say yes, more people get to have a piece of, of my vision <laughs> and what I'm creating? Like what what does that yeah. do for you? Yeah, it's a it's such a weird new experience um, that like I never imagined uh, people hunting fractions of my artwork before until this year. Um, so it's like I I haven't had time to develop a a full set of thoughts on it. I mean, it's it it is strange to not have one specific owner for for a piece of your work. There's definitely probably a part of me that's coming from kind of a, a traditional sense that uh that wants to see just a single owner of the work maybe hoping that they i don't know take care of it in some way i mean silly with like a digital work but um uh there's some part of my brain that's that's like telling me that but 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 then i i also think about it and it's it is uh democratizing the work in the sense of uh it's allowing for for communal participation and any sort of financial upside so um, I really try not to to think too much about the financial upside and all that, but um, I, I'm I'm sure that for collectors that's um, part of the equation for them, at least yeah. uh, at least some of them. And so um, yeah, I'm well aware that like for the are are out of the price range for for many people. Like I couldn't really buy one of my own. I mean, it's like it would be a stretch <laughs> for me. Uh, so I'm I'm well aware of that, and um, uh, so yeah, I I, I mean I. Like, I don't, if there is financial upside, I don't know that art is like a great uh, investment strategy necessarily, right? Like it's, it's artwork. Um, but uh, if there's a financial upside, I guess allowing uh, regular people to participate in it too is a good thing. And so 
Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a weird it's a good thing, way to look at it. Yeah. Overall, I think there are some positive aspects to fractionalization. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I think just because you, you talked about the financial side, I want to ask you one thing, although I don't want to, I don't want to focus too much on the dog and everybody can go see that. Sure. Uh, but when, when you saw your, one of your pieces for the first time get sold for seven figures, yeah, what was that feel, feeling like to you? Um, man, I, I, uh, I feel like I've been, uh, in wonderland for like months. Um, it's, it's just been a daily progression of like things that I can't believe, like stacking on top of each other. Um, like I, I feel like I left reality like a long time ago <laughs> now at this point. And so, uh, you know, like a seven figure sale was just like another wild thing on the list. And, um, I mean, it, I don't even know if the impact of it has fully sunk in yet because it's so far from what I expected to happen this year. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it puts me in a, in a small group of very fortunate artists. I'm very fortunate to be in this position. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I believe my work is good. Um, uh, but, um, there's a lot of artists out there that have fantastic work and, mm -hmm. um, don't get the same sort of opportunity. And so, um, I feel, I feel incredibly, uh, privileged to, to, to be in this position. And, um, I don't know, I, I, Hopefully I can do something good with that. That's all. That's all I, I can love, say. I love to hear it. I love to hear it. Pre, pre NFTs, when you're creating uh, your pieces, did you ever yeah. feel at a moment where like, oh, why am I doing this? Like, what's the point? <laughs> like oh, people, yeah. people don't get it. Should I just stop and focus on something yeah. else? Did you ever have those doubts, those fears? Yeah. Can you walk me through that? Yeah, like, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, I said this a little bit earlier, but, uh, pre NFT, like making it as an artist is a real right. grind. Um, I had lots of, you know, lots of months with, with no sales. I had, um, lots of, uh, commissions that, uh, went poorly, like clients didn't like the work. I got turned down from, uh, numerous, numerous, um, uh, you know, shows and, and, and other things that I had to apply to. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and that was like some, after me working as hard as I could for years on something, um, uh, just kind of barely scraping along. And so, um, yeah, I absolutely, uh, questioned things and kind of wondered if I should just like, just like go skateboarding instead and just, uh, like enjoy my <laughs> life a little bit more. Um, but, uh, you know. Ultimately, you know, I mentioned that, that making artwork makes me happy. And um, anytime that I stopped making artwork, uh, for better or for worse, I would get unhappy. And so really? I, I always went back to making the artwork. And I, I was fortunate enough that there were there were other people out there that, that believed in me. I had a, a core set of, of collectors and friends um, that, that uh, enjoyed my work and um, supported me in, in every way they could. And... Um, uh, all those small positive interactions stacked up and, and kept me going and made me feel like I actually had a chance and that, that I was on the right track. And so even though I did have doubts, I also, um, uh, felt, felt well supported and, and had some faith in myself. Powerful, super powerful. Do you ever, you ever take a minute to like, think about that and like reflect on those days and kind of see how that changed and what feels like overnight a lot of people would yeah. say yeah you know oh yeah i, I think i reflect on that like every day uh, <laughs> no yeah. you know i only ask that because you're saying every single day just beats the next right and every single day now right. beats the next and you're yeah. seeing seven figure sales and not to talk about the money but more about the awareness that you're creating around this type of art and the right. level of appreciation that people are having for it right, right? when yeah. back in the day you went through yeah. so many days where it was just like like what the hell, what the hell, right. what the hell, or at least from what you're telling. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I only highlight that because it's, it's interesting to hear you as a creator, you as an artist to just go through that, you know, that, that wave, you know, and kind of seeing where you are today. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I hope that that um, maybe provides some some motivation for other artists that are out there. I mean, I think um, uh, it would be it would be extremely unrealistic of me for me to like promise anywhere you know near what I've been l lucky to to experience this year. But um, uh, if you if you do keep grinding it out, I mean, you really can't. You will catch a break sooner or later. Um, not not always huge breaks, but um, there there will be something there and. Um, you know, again, it's kind of a cliche saying, but but like luck is the what is it the intersection of uh, uh, preparation and opportunity, right? So like, if I hadn't had uh, everything ready to go for this Fidenza algorithm at the same time that Artblocks was was coming up, then then Fidenza never would have been the thing that it was. And um, as I've already admitted, I, I did get very lucky with that, but. Um, uh, if I hadn't been preparing for years and then, then I wouldn't have even been able to be lucky. And so, yeah, if you're an artist or a creator, you, you, you sort of have to just accept that it. it might take, it might take some time and just to keep uh, working and make smart decisions every day. And, and hopefully those add up to, to something positive for you. That's a, that's a great way to almost end off. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this final question. Okay. What can we expect next from you? Are we thinking Sotheby's? Are we thinking Christie's? <laughs> what are we, <laughs> What are we, what are we thinking over here? Yeah. Uh, I don't, <laughs> well, in yeah. terms of art, I'm just right, joking, right, right. right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't think about auction houses, uh, or anything like that. Um, um, I have announced, uh, that I, I do plan to put out more work this year. Um, I haven't said anything about it yet, but what I'll say is, um, for this year, these will be a little bit smaller projects, so I'm not looking to like one up Fidenza this year. Uh, but um, which, by the way, I don't think is in your control per se. Right. <laughs> right. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Continue. not even not even to one up from my own personal artistic perspective. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's okay. Say that. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but but I do uh, plan to continue working on more long form generative work like Fidenza. Um, I, I have some ideas that I've been playing with around that that uh, I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, mostly I think about um, just ways to, to to create new artwork that I think is going to be interesting and um, um, to try to do the best work that I can. And um, um, yeah, I mean, there'll be, there'll be new work. Um, hopefully it'll be good. I think it'll be good. And... Other than that, you have to wait and see. Amazing. Do you have a date for when the next piece is going to come out? I've not announced any dates yet. Okay. I'm trying to get some alpha leak here, man. What I is know. this? <laughs> I, know. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. Before I let you go, shout yourself out. Where can we find you? Uh, yeah. Where can we learn more about your pieces? Give us the show. Sure, sure. Um, so pretty much everywhere online, my handle is Tyler X Hobbs, H-O-B-B-S. Um, so on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at Tyler X Hobbs. My website is TylerXHobbs.com. Uh, those are pretty much the three places to go. I have a Discord channel now as well. Um, and I hang around the art block scene as well. So that's pretty much where you can find me. And I hope to uh, see some of y'all and meet some of y'all uh, sooner rather than later. Awesome. What a, what a good way to end off. Tyler, thank you so much for being on Mint. Uh, and I hope to have you on again soon. Thank you so much, Adam. This has been fantastic.